Hey, wake up. It's time for part two. Okay, and welcome back to part two of part two or part three. In this section, we finally start assembling the actual extrusion rails. So as we left off, I mentioned that the extrusion rails were missing the threading in the holes. I reached out to the company and at first we were having uh, email issues. I was getting angry thinking that they weren't responding, but it turned out we were just you know, having trouble getting each other's emails. So eventually they called me and we agreed that they would send me out a tap just so I could tap out the holes myself. Made no sense to start shipping things around or shipping new things out. So they sent me a tap in the mail. I tapped out the 20 by 40 extrusion rails without any problem. And then on the 20 by 60, uh, basically the bit broke off. The tap went in perfectly fine, but as soon as I reversed it on the first hole, it snapped. So I reached out to them again and they went ahead and just sent me a replacement 20 by 60 extrusion rail uh, free of charge and the project continued. So the first step in this part is to install the two 20 by 60 rails onto the two sides of your aux plates that make up your Y axis. So first it's just installing these two into the aux plate, six screws to combine three for each rail on each side, grand total of 12 screws. Now after I install these, I actually noticed that they were not even on the other end. So I went ahead and tightened down both of the 20 by 60s on one end. And when I looked at the other, they were not parallel. One was a different size than the other. At first, this kind of confused the mess out of me because I actually pulled out my squares and started checking and they were so close that you could not detect any unsquareness. But apparently they were off just enough that it caused that effect by the time you got to the end of the 1500 millimeter range. What I wound up doing was just loosening them a little bit, attaching both sides, and then tightening them both down. And basically everything stayed perfectly parallel after that. So while there was some play and they weren't perfect, after the final assembly, everything smoothed out without any issues. So to bring it all home, once I finally figured that out, I went ahead and started the first part of this step, which is to attach your 20 by 40 and your two 20 by 60s to one side of the aux plates. Basically, there's gonna be a grand total of nine screws holding on the three extrusion rails to the aux plate on the one side. You only want to attach the one side because in the next step, we're going to start inserting some of the T-nuts into the extrusion rails. And on to step 13. Here we are basically just adding T-nuts to the extrusion rails to mount the L brackets that are gonna be used to help add structural rigidity to the system. Uh, this is one of the things that, I don't know if the wiki's been updated yet, but it actually told you to do it on one side and then to repeat this step on the other side. But in this first step here, the, per the wiki, you're actually installing all of the T-nuts that will be used for in this process for both sides. So we're basically, in this case, just taking the T-nuts and sliding them in to the extrusion rails in the indicated locations. Now, I'm not actually sure if it matters, but in the picture, it looked like you wanted to install it with the big side of your T-nut facing up, but I installed mine with it facing down because when I did it up, it looked like it didn't really want to I wasn't sure if it would have worked as well, so I put them down. But in theory, it's just a threaded portion. As long as it can reach it, it doesn't matter. Um, if anyone knows differently, please let me know. Uh, the, I'm sort of new to this. So if there's something about these T-nuts that work better when they are facing a certain direction, I would love to know about it. And once those T-nuts are in, you then want to install your X slash Z axis assembly onto the extrusion rails that you just mounted to the one aux plate. And basically you're gonna be mounting this so that the Z portion is facing the front, which is the opposite direction of the 20 by 40. So the 20 by 40 is on the back and the other direction will be the front facing part and that's where your Z axis from that gantry assembly will be installed. And once you get your XZ axis installed onto the extrusion rails, 
You then attach the other aux plate with nine of the low profile screws, just like the other side. And now on to step 14, where we start installing some of the brackets to help add some rigidity into the system. So in part one, I made the comment that when you're building kits such as this, it's for someone who is doing this as a hobby. And this is one of the examples of what I'm talking about. This system comes with aluminum brackets. I call them L brackets earlier, but it's actually a angle corner bracket. And these brackets actually have little tabs on them that you have to file off. If you're ever buying something and just putting it together, you shouldn't have to be filing parts down unless it came from Harbor Freight. You know, we're used to that with Harbor Freight stuff. But this is one of the things I meant by this is a hobbyist thing that you're doing as much for this being the hobby as the end result. So just something to keep in mind. And basically once all that filing is done, then those 10 brackets get installed onto the 10 T-nuts that we installed earlier into the corners. Now, you basically put a screw through on the one side and then you, which screws right into your T-nut. So you basically put a screw into the T-nut on the one side with the extrusion rail. On the other side, you're putting in one of the nylon lock nuts and a bolt. The problem is inside the little thing, it, it shows you using a wrench to hold that down. There is no way you're going to get any wrench inside there to hold those bolts. I fought with that thing and fought with it. I finally just grabbed some needle nose pliers and put it on the nylon nut to hold it while I was tightening these down. I do believe that they actually specifically make a square nut designed just for using inside of these corner brackets. I think I've seen them on Amazon. Why those weren't used here, I'm not really sure. I don't think you, you need a nylon nut in this case. I think they should have used that other thing. But at any rate, you basically attach these 10 with the bolts into the T-nuts and the bolts to the nylon washers. And that is the end of this step. Finally, getting close to the end. Now we start assembling the base of the machine. One interesting thing in the first step is you'll notice there is a bracket and the bracket actually has holes that are closer to the edge on one side than the other. In the manual, it kind of shows you one going one way, one going the other, but because there's two of them and it doesn't show you both of them at the same time, you don't know if they had an intention of them being any kind of a way. Honestly, from what I can tell, it does not matter. You can install them in any order you want to. As long as they're there, you're good. I started off this step by measuring the first extrusion rail. It doesn't give you an exact dimension, but these other two rails that you see there will kind of butt up to that. And I, I decided to place them even. So basically I just measured the length divided by three to get an idea of how long each section would go, then mark inside from there. Um, it it kind of doesn't really matter. This is just to help keep the machine stable and everything there. After I did it, I found out that they were almost exactly the same dimensions as the top of the bench. And then I actually tweaked them later on to actually perfectly line up with the tabletop of the bench itself. Once that's all done, you then go ahead and grab some of the T-nuts and slide in the T-nuts onto the extrusion rail. There was a grand total of eight per each end for these rails that I'm installing now. Next, you install the T-nuts into the two rails that are going to intersect that one end rail that we just got through using. And finally, you pull out the dual position angled brackets to attach the three pieces together, the two from one direction attaching into the other. And what you do on the one end, you basically just copy paste on the other end so that it matches identical. And you are done with this step. Now that the main base parts are installed, it's time to attach your C-beams onto the base. This is one place where I found, for lack of a better word, an error in the math and the diagrams from MakerStore, and I reached out to them. We will see if they fix this later on. Long story short, the extrusion rail between your two aux plates is 1500 millimeters. 
The extrusion rails that we just got through installing for our base is also 1500 millimeters. So everything in theory lines up and it's all dimensionally the same. The problem is the way the aux plates are installed onto the C-beams, it causes a small little gap on each side, making basically the width of your C-beams a few millimeters shorter than the extrusion rail. In the wiki, the diagram, it shows you to install the C-beams on the far outside edge. But as you see here, what I discovered is you actually have to move it in either all the way on one side or a little bit on both sides. I wound up moving one of mine all the way in and leaving the other one flush. I may or may not change that later on, not really sure. I discovered this because when I put them all the way to the edge and I did a measurement, the inside measurement was smaller because I was actually bending the C-beam inward about three millimeters. And what I wound up doing was moving my gantry all the way to one end, loosening and tightening up the C-beam on top of the base on each end. And then when I measured, they were identically the same. And like I said, it was approximately three millimeters short of the 1500 millimeters. So having said all of that, you basically, to attach these D-beams, you put three of the T-nuts into the extrusion, and there is a special plate that will attach your C-beam to the extrusion. And that's what you see us attaching here. One of these will go on each of the four corners, and you can see here which way they are angled into each other, and they sort of slide and adjust. So as I was just speaking, instead of pushing the one side all the way out, you either need to make each one about, give or take about a millimeter and a half short, or make one side about three millimeters short, as you saw in the previous photos. Once you have the four brackets attached to each of the corners, you then set the C-beam on top of the base extrusion rail with the C portion facing outwards away from each other towards the outside of the machine. The C-beam has holes drilled in and threaded into the ends so that you can use screws to attach the plate to the C-beam as you see here. But make note that you're only attaching one of the two ends. So you attach the bolts to the C-beam on this one end, leaving the other unattached so that we can take the gantry and move the gantry onto the C-beams before attaching the other end. On to step 17. As it says here, we are finishing the project. So now we're gonna take the giant heavy gantry assembly that we've been building in the first video and install it onto the C-beams of the chassis that we just got through building in part two. So that now we're gonna start finishing the machine up and bringing it together. It's gonna to finally start looking like an actual route. And, and this is one thing that's kind of interesting, like I'm not sure I'm a fan of the way we do this because we've built this machine to be rigid and stable and yet they have us attaching one end and then kind of forcing it up to be able to install the gantry. So you're kind of forcing it to stress the connections and the screws and kind of force them to move around, which I'm not really a big fan of. I would have preferred if we had put this on first and then sat the whole assembly down. Now it probably would have taken two people and it did work out fine. So I can't really complain, but I'm not really a huge fan of sort of stressing these joints in order to put this assembly together. But at any rate, once you get the end lifted up, as you see here, I basically used a two by four to lift up the other end so that the end of the C-beams would be exposed well enough that I could pick my gantry up and slide it onto the C-beam, then kind of gently slide the two by four out of the picture in order to get everything sat down and back to where it's supposed to be so that I can start attaching everything. And now that everything is sitting where it needs to be, we can go ahead and put the remaining screws to the metal plates and attach the C-beams to the bottom frame 
the same as we did on the other end. At this point, I wanted to go ahead and start checking the reliability and the structural integrity of the system. So at this point, we started measuring and adjusting everything, measuring the cross measurements to make sure everything was square, making sure that everything was the same distance from each other. Basically just kind of going through and double checking to make sure everything you've been putting together is square. You really should do it during the full part of your project, but at this point you're getting close to that point of no return where you really want to make sure everything is correct. I also use this moment to readjust the wheels. If you remember earlier in the video I talked about the gantry assembly, the axles being kind of tight so that it was hard to get them onto the C-beams. So at this point I went ahead and loosened up all of the axles, got everything kind of as loose as it could go, tightened it back up so that I could then use the eccentrics later on to do the fine adjustments. This was also the part that I mentioned earlier where I discovered that when I measured the two ends I had a longer distance than I did in the very center if the gantry was in the center. And this gets back to the issue where because of the gap between your C-beam and the aux plate, you basically have to move that one side off of that wall. And that was one of the things I discovered during this actual step. And now it's time to make the magic happen. The entire concept behind the aux gear is that it's using Instead of using belts for your timing, it's actually using a rack and pinion gear system. So now we need to install the rack and pinion gear, the plastic gearing type system that slides into the V-slot in order to allow your Y-axis to actually go back and forth. There's basically three on each side and these just slide into the extrusion rail. Now one thing you need to make sure is that there are no gaps. You need to just look up under this thing and make darn sure there are no gaps between your pieces. Because if you don't, you'll do like I did. Basically, these were longer than they needed to be. So after inserting the three in, it stuck out a little ways and I had to trim them down. Unfortunately, I had a small gap that I didn't know about and later on when I started exercising the system, I kept hearing a banging where it was pushing one of these around as the motors were turning. So I actually went up cutting mine a little bit too short. And I had to kind of improvise and put one of the pieces that I'd cut off back into the system on one end just to tighten it back up. So when you slide these in, make darn sure they are all the way in and touching each other. Just really get in there and look. I also recommend leaving a very small amount sticking out, about one tooth worth of that gear. They have a little bit of a flexibility to them and to ensure that they are truly touching, if you leave about one tooth sticking out and then use the screw in plate that you're going to install the next step to push that in, it will keep everything nice and tight. I went up doing this on both sides. Now we start putting in all the little filler plates to kind of just clean things up and make it look pretty. These are really just nothing but a little aluminum plate and a screw that goes into all the exposed ends of the extrusion rails that fill in those places to make them. It just makes it look a little bit better. It's, it's all these are for. Technically, if you didn't put these on and you use this for something else, you could kind of do other things as well. So yeah, totally optional if you don't want to use these, but it does make the system look a little bit better. In a small way, I find it a little bit odd that after the finishing touches, we kind of then go back and install all of the components related to making the x-axis move. But yeah, so now that we're through with the final touches, we have to go back and install all of the, the belts and the belt components for the x-axis. In fact, it even tells you to see below for how to do something after giving you the picture, but then there's actually nothing below it. Um, I actually found that a few things in this case. So the belt they sent me was about twice as long as it needed to be. So I wound up cutting the belt down. Basically, the belt kind of feeds through the V slot itself with the teeth down under the one wheel up over the pulley and under the other wheel to the two ends and on the two ends it attaches with one of the brackets now there's a couple things I learned in this in the picture you see that the bracket has 
an indentation to hold the head of the screw and that indentation is facing up so that your screw would be, for lack of a better word, flush. The screws that they tell you to use when you do it this way will bottom out on the extrusion rail before it tightens down. So your little plate will actually be loose. If you flip this plate over and put the indentation down, then your screw will sit up a little bit higher, but it allows you to tighten it down without actually bottoming out your screw. So basically the standard T-nut is gonna go first towards the towards your x-axis and the belt is going to wind up going underneath this one so that when the screw goes into that t-nut it's going to push down and basically lock into place on your timing belt the second screw because it uses that other type of locking that other type of nut the other type of t-nut it can't the belt can't go underneath that so that one is used to lock the plate in place that keeps your plate from moving and the screw and the other one is the one that's actually going to hold the tension to your belt if you tighten this belt too much it's just going to stretch anyway so you want it tight enough that it doesn't slip but not so tight that and there is no real ex explanation in the manual that kind of gives you a good explanation of this. So you're going to have to just kind of wing it. Like I said, basically you want to make sure it doesn't slip a tooth as it's moving, but you want to have it just tight enough for that and not any tighter. And with that, the project is complete. There is still a lot of other things that have to be done. Again, this is just the mechanical kit. This does not include any of the electronics. Uh, the drag chains, the wiring. So all of that is still to come in video number three slash four part two. Uh, so yeah, th there'll be more videos upcoming of the rest of this project, but for now the mechanical kit itself has been completed. In the next video, we will try to put together a actual review of everything, all of the things that I've seen so far that I like, dislike, everything that I've run into and kind of give you a good idea of what my opinions are on this machine. So if you haven't already, go ahead and subscribe so that you can see the additional stuff coming up and we look forward to seeing you in the next video.